such a fun auctioneer and it was just absolutely fabulous. And I want to thank everybody who just bought dinners out with me because you know the thing is I come to your house and make you dinner for free and you didn't know it but I'm, I'm very very grateful for all the support for the Green Party. I've been asked to speak for 15 minutes and tell you what my first year in office has been like and tell you what's coming up and how we save the whole world. So I'm going to, I'm going to be speaking very fast and um, je peux aussi c'est obligatoire, je peux en français, c'est la traduction comme je peux. I'll have to skip the French part. So I'm thrilled to be here with my friend Adrian Carr. I well remember November 19th because while you were waiting for 45 minutes with a camera stuck in your face, I was in Ottawa where it was a whole lot later, you know, being a big country in a three hour time zone. And I was actually tracking the votes because the wonderful Craig Canton, who works at Green Party, was reporting out to people, those of us who were too technologically challenged to figure out how to do it ourselves and posting the results. So on my little Blackberry, I was like, oh, ahead, oh, behind. It was like, I don't know what. Two in the morning before I knew Adrian had won and could go to bed happy. And I also, of course, had just, you know, earlier that year, as Adrian mentioned, May 2nd, 2011, I was elected the first member of parliament for the Green Party. And it was an amazing uh, upset because although I was sure that that it was very likely. I mean, you know, you know when you're waving at cars and people are honking horns and you could knock on doors and you look down streets and there's Green Party signs everywhere. But the conventional wisdom, such as it was, was that I didn't have a hope in hell. And I remember being interviewed by a guest host on the Bill Good Show, definitely not Bill Good, from CKW the week before the election. I don't know if any of you heard this. Yes, and he said, with all due respect, you couldn't be elected dog catcher. Oh. And I thought, gee, the due respect part didn't last until the end of the sentence. And I said to him, well, actually, I think I have a pretty good chance. But what I was thinking was, <laughs> what I was thinking was, he's right. I would never want to be dog catcher. <laughs> want to take all the dogs home. I would be no good at it at all. I'm completely unskilled to be a dog catcher. And thank goodness I'm running to be a member of parliament. I think, I think I'll be really good at that. But dog catcher, ooh, not so much. So, you know, maybe he didn't mean to be disrespectful or any of that. Then it's amazing how the punditry and the, you know, the media conventional wisdom immediately shifts gears, right? They're never wrong. Okay, so somehow I won, which wasn't supposed to happen. But immediately, it makes no difference. We hear from all the pundits because one green MP can't do anything. And actually, she's one of my favorite media people, so I hate to recall Katie O'Malley on, on the house. Because she said, well, the Greens are all happy now because they got elected. But we'll never hear from her again because one MP can't do anything. She can't sit on committee. She may be at the lunch. She'll never get a question question her. The funny thing is, now some of you will have a sense of this because you know you're here and I've been people have been saying really nice things to me all night. But after my first chronological year as a member of parliament, we had a question from the Victoria Times columnist asking my staff do we know whether, you know, I've spoken how often in the House of Commons compared to the average MP, right? How much have I spoken in the House of Commons really? So we checked and we discovered that I've actually spoken more in the House of Commons than any MP. <laughs> And then I ask questions and questions period. It turns out I get a question once a week. I can make points of order anytime there's an appropriate point of order to be made. I figured out you can go to any committee in the House of Commons that's meeting. They have a right to sit at the table. I have to ask for the discretion of the chair to ask a question. 
that doesn't work so well, but I do manage to get, thanks to the miracle of blackberries, it's a whole lot easier than passing a note. You notice that? So if I want a question asked and I'm at a parliamentary committee, I just write a little email to one of my friends in one of the other parties, and they're so glad to have a good question, they usually ask it. <laughs> through the use of volunteers, I have at any given time somewhere between 18 and 24 interns who are volunteers who are getting usually graduate degrees at U of O or Carleton who are assigned to a specific committee. And they are my eyes and ears on the ground and they tell me what's going on in the committees and that's how we stay on top of the legislation and that's how we're prepared to introduce amendments at report stage. That's how come I introduced 330 amendments to Bill C-38, the first round of the budget. And I didn't achieve what I wanted to achieve. I wanted to change the bill. I wanted to make it impossible for them not to agree to some amendments by creating a voting process that would take so long that they would have to relent. Because if each one of my amendments that had been accepted by the Speaker as in order had received a separate vote, which I believe they should have, we would have been voting for four days. As it was, they compressed the votes, so we were only voting for 23 and a half hours straight. And I don't think anyone but me would have been willing to go through four days, so I felt that they would compromise. So sadly, at least what it proved was that Stephen Harper was prepared to submit a bill of 425 pages that fundamentally changed, deleted, repealed, destroyed 70 different laws, and that bill would go from first reading through second reading through committee, back at report stage, through passage to royal assent without a single change of even the most minor <coughs> aspect. I mean, not a comma, not a semicolon, nothing. That's very unusual. I used to work in government, we used to, I mean, the point of parliamentary committees is to approve the legislation. So I'm also watching since, of course, I've been there in exactly the period in which Stephen Harper has formed a false majority with a minority of the votes, he's got a majority of the seats, and it's absolutely appalling to watch legislation that we've had, well, it was bad enough in C-38, legislation that was passed under Brian Mulroney, like the Canadian Environmental Assessment, well, introduced under Brian Mulroney, passed under Jean Chrétien, was the Environmental Assessment Act. The Fisheries Act amendments are our habitat we've had since the 1960s. But this new bill, C-45, is savaging the Navigable Waters Protection Act that we've had since 1882. And deciding, as you probably know, that navigable waters in Canada, unlike the definition we've had since 1882, that a piece, a body of water is navigable, if you could get a canoe or a kayak down it, the definition of navigable is now ever so much easier. You just look at the list at the back of the bill. So where Canada has millions of lakes, they're prepared to list 97 of them. And where we have tens of thousands of rivers, we now have a bill that lists 62 rivers, 62. One only for the Yukon, I mean, very few for me. So you look at this, you think, this is outrageous. So of course, I'm now preparing amendments on that. I love my job in the House of Commons. I love being able to raise issues before other people see them. And that's because I'm just there doing the work. People wonder, what if, how come I read C-38 before anybody else? Because it's there and I have to work on it. Other MPs, are for, and this is not to put too much time on this, but I need to explain what's happening to Parliament, which is what's really happening to democracy, is that all the other parties control their MPs, totally, all the time. All the other parties tell their MPs how they're going to vote, every day, all the time, on every bill. Every day, the parliamentary pages, who are wonderful young people attending the University of Ottawa, who get through a very competitive selection process, get to be pages in the House of Commons, one of their duties is to receive from the whip, something the Green Party will never have, actually, no whips, but every other party has a party whip, who hands out to the pages how that party is voting that day, 
and every piece of paper, they're not even told privately and have to hold it in their brains till they get out there to remember. Every single desk of every single MP, other than the two independents, and of course me, get a piece of paper put on that desk. All the conservatives, all the NDP, all the liberals, and even the four remaining Bloc Quebecois MPs get the piece of paper that says, today on the first vote, vote no, on the second vote, vote yes, on the third vote, no, capital down, we. Oui. It's extraordinary to me. And uh, one day the pieces of paper were being handed out, one of my friends, and I've made tons of friends. When I bring my daughter to Parliament, um, I find myself saying, oh, oh, I want you to meet another friend from work. And it doesn't matter if they're conservatives or liberals or new democrats or bloc, they're my friends, and I really want my daughter to meet them. So one of my friends from work turned around and said to me, as he looked at his list of how he was supposed to vote that day, so listen, how do you know how to vote? <laughs> One of those funny things I have to mention. You know. So they all know, and, they, and you know what? They wish they could do it too. That's the, the sad secret. It's actually the hopeful secret of Canadian democracy. I would say, from knowing my friends at work, that by far the vast majority, approaching 90% of them, would, in different circumstances, I'd be proud to have them as Green Party candidates. They're all good people, they care about their communities. Their main inspiration to run for Parliament is to be of service. They believe that what they're doing is going to be a good thing for their country. And they don't learn the sad truth until they're elected. That they have no role, they have no voice, they have no brain. They're supposed to sit there and do what they're told and toe the party line. They're supposed to vote how they're told. God knows why any of them would ever read the legislation, because if they read it, they might realize they have a different opinion than how they're told to vote. And that's why, I hate to say this out loud, but I don't think any of the other MPs read all the legislation, or even most, because why would you? Political party structures are there to tell people how to think, what to speak, they're handed the notes to tell them what to say. It's tragic, because it's a squandering of the, you know, the goodwill and the good intentions of a bunch of really decent people who are being essentially held hostage by a system of hyper-partisan party politics run by a bunch of people who really don't differ very much from each other. And that group of people, I think there's you know a clinical definition for them somewhere in the DSM, but they are the spin doctors. They may be sociopathic, they may be psychopathic, I'm not sure, they will never run for election. They will never put themselves out there. They live in the dark places. They use focus groups and polling and all kinds of strategy to figure out how to get to a victory, to win power. And what they want to do with that power once they get it isn't relevant to the people who are actually calling the shots. So every day in the House of Commons, the kinds of things that get raised by other parties are not the things that are right in front of us as work. They're the things they think will get them on the news for a quick sound bite and a bump in the polls. It's why when I was trying to, to raise awareness of the fact that Stephen Harper had already signed in Vladivostok the Canada-China Investment Treaty, and we hadn't seen the text of it yet, and first I demanded to see the text. Then when we got the text, I found we weren't going to have a vote or a debate. And while this was to me the number one issue before Parliament, all the other opposition parties we're fixated on one thing. Do you even remember now what the one big thing was? E. coli in the plant, the XLB plant. Now that's clearly, and I'm setting it, <coughs> that's clearly a scandal. But it is not important compared to the Canada-China Investment Treaty. And I couldn't get any of the other parties to pay sufficient attention to decide that this was the issue we had to take on in the 21 sitting days when that was before the House of Commons. Now the 21 sitting days are up, and I'm still not prepared to give up on fighting the Canada-China Investment Treaty. It's not ratified yet. <laughs> now the fact, the fact that it's not ratified yet is good news. Because legally, because it, it, you know, and it's not morally correct, and it's not even constitutionally correct, previous prime ministers would have always put a treaty of this importance 
in front of Parliament for a vote, even if it wasn't legally required. I mean, I actually had to go back to my, I'm glad I saved all my law books from law school. I actually went back to my old constitutional law book to check, and yes, a treaty of importance, even if it doesn't require implementing legislation, such as this one, even if it doesn't require a vote in Parliament, every other Prime Minister would have put it forward as a matter of course. In the same way that Jean Chrétien took the Kyoto Protocol, which was a treaty that did not require implementing legislation, it went to the House of Commons for a vote. This treaty, which will bind Canada for a minimum of 15 years, and then it's automatically renewed for another 15 years, unless Canada gives a one-year written notice that we want out of it, and at the point that we give the one-year written notice that we would get out of it, at the end of that one-year written notice, any existing Chinese investment in Canada is protected for a further 15 years under the treaty. So to add that up, that's 31 years we're stuck. And that gives state-owned enterprises of China, like Sinopec, the fifth largest corporation on earth, which I would imagine, to Stephen Harper's discomfort, is the number one purchaser of Iranian oil, and which has practices, I mean, you can imagine, this is, this is a country that, you know, you try to form a union, you end up in jail. This is not a place of, you know, they say, oh, human rights are improving in China. Well, Amnesty International doesn't think so. Human Rights Watch doesn't think so. The Tibetan monks who are self-immolating don't think so. What makes Stephen Harper think human rights are improved in China? Well, there's one reason. It turns out, which who knew this, if you're developing the oil sands and you have, as Stephen Harper does, a goal, believe it or not, a goal of six million barrels of oil a day, this is a goal I have never heard from any of the oil patch CEOs. This is a goal unique to Stephen Harper. He wants six million barrels of oil a day from the oil sands. They're currently at 1.7 million barrels of oil a day. And you know what? It must be hard for him because free market capitalism has let him down. <laughs> Too many CEOs turn out to be weak-willed, yellow-livered, <laughs> pussy-footing cowards because they start looking at market forces and saying, like Suncor is saying now, cabinet gave them approval for the Jocelyn mine to expand in the oil sands. And Joe Oliver announced, we're giving the permit for the Jocelyn mine, and it's terrible that all those environmental reviews held up this mine. But we're approving the Jocelyn mine. Suncor and its partner for the Jocelyn mine, Total SA in France, are looking at market forces and looking at prices of oil and looking at the cost of expanding the oil sands, and they said, you know, we're going to go slow on that one. And we're not interested in pursuing it right now. It doesn't make sense economically. So, of course, Stephen Harper. <laughs> He's never been so let down by free market capitalism. And it turns out, I never thought I'd see it. I've worked all my whole life in public policy and working to protect the environment. I thought our enemies were globalization and multinationals and corporate greed. Turns out, there is a critical deficit globally of rapacious capitalist corporations. There's a, there is simply an insufficient amount of corporate free market greed. And so as a result, they have to go for rapacious communist greed because they can't get enough money from the free market. So they've got to get the money from China. That's the root of it. China hasn't changed. So now, not only have we allowed pressure from China, and I'm certain of this, it's pressure from the People's Republic of China that led to killing Fisheries Act habitat protections, repealing the Environmental Assessment Act, changing the National Energy Board Act so that Cabinet has the ability to overturn an NAD decision. Those are all things, and now the Navigable Waters Protection Act. These are moves to expedite development and they, it's clear that in the past, Chinese investors had complained that they didn't like the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. I don't see any reason. I mean, I mean, Stephen Harper on his own and his own antipathy towards all things environmental, that can explain most of it. But the, the real smoking gun here in my theory is the decision to say that cabinet can overturn an NEB decision. Because the National Energy Board is not controlled by Greenpeace. The National Energy Board approves pipelines. The National Energy Board does not turn down pipelines. 
So why would Stephen Harper decide that it was important in Bill C-38, the omnibus bill, to fundamentally change the role of a quasi-judicial body like the NEB and say it's now merely making recommendations, not decisions, and cabinet can overturn them? I think it's because he probably had a conversation in Beijing in February in which they said, how can you promise us the Northern Gateway project is going ahead? Isn't there a risk that this regulatory body you have might say no. I mean, one can easily understand the anxiety of the People's Republic of China about the reliability of Stephen Harper to dictate things in a democracy. <coughs> so he changed the law. I'm sure of it. How much more will we be unable to repair these laws in the future if the People's Republic of China has the right to sue us? If we change our laws or improve them in such a way that they lose their expectation of profits. That's why this is a terrifying prospect. Just this week, under Chapter 11 of NAFTA, which works the same way in terms of investor state provisions, a US based corporation is suing the province of Quebec for banning fracking. So here I am in the House of Commons working on these issues, and I feel sometimes as though well, I always feel that my work is valuable. I work really hard across party lines. I've prepared a lot of background material for MPs in particularly the Conservative Caucus in hopes they find a way to stop their boss from ratifying this treaty. I called every premier across Canada. I begged everybody. It's not ratified yet, so we don't give up on stopping it. But I've got to say the one thing that right now has me so happy, I feel like I have a winning lotto ticket in my pocket and I'm scared to take it out and check the number because I want it so much I can't bear it. And that's the by-elections. Because right now, we're close to having two new Green Party members of Parliament to join me in Ottawa. <laughs> asking some of the young greens here, can you come over to Victoria and canvas with us? We've got a little bit more time left, but if you can't come over to Victoria, you can go to our website and you can sign up to do phone canvassing from your own home. We have a great software program. You can just do it off your computer. Our candidate in Victoria is a friend of mine from almost the last 30 years. His name is Donald Galloway. He's a professor of law at UVic and he has volunteer time, done so much on human rights issues on refugee rights, on immigration law. He's a wonderful candidate. He's wowing them in the debate. And we're getting, we're clearly in second place and we're catching up on the NDP. This is the first time ever that I've been involved in a campaign which is clearly, it's either gonna be an NDP member of parliament or it's gonna be a Green member of parliament. The Conservatives are at 12% in Victoria. Yeah. <laughs> You know, we're close. It killed me to leave, it, you know, <laughs> in Vancouver Island to come over here tonight. And I thought, you know, I promised Adrian and it's really, really important, but I just want to be knocking on doors in Victoria. Meanwhile, in Calgary Center, where I'm going tomorrow, I don't know how many of you are following this, but our candidate is Chris Turner, author of The Geography of Hope, The Leap, How to Survive and Thrive in a Sustainable Future. He's a brilliant author, he's a journalist, and he's got buzz going in Calgary Center right now. The last poll out of Calgary Center showed that in the last two weeks, his polling had improved 109%. In the election, we're now at 24% in Calgary. We're, we're about to eclipse Liberal. We're about to eclipse the Conservative. We're about to elect a Green Party member of Parliament in Calgary. So we need your help in Calgary. With more greens we can do, with two greens we can do twice as much as I've been doing. It's an obvious math, right? With three greens we can do three times as much as I've been doing. And the best part is, going back to those poor oppressed legions of really wonderful people who made the mistake of running for big parties that tell them what to do and tell them what to think and tell them what to say, is we can prove that it's possible to be a political party with a leader in the House and with members of Parliament who function as intelligent human beings on their own. Right this isn't about the Green Party doing well. I swear to you, I'm not that partisan yet. 
This is about rescuing democracy from the clutches of an increasingly dictatorial system which shows consistent abuse and contempt for parliament and democracy itself. We have very little time. We have this moment in which we can prove to the rest of Canada that with Greens in the House, we change everything. So back to Katie O'Malley and her idea that one Green MP couldn't do anything. Then they noticed, gee, how come Elizabeth May is the one who's organized all the opposition parties to fight Bill C-38? Maybe that was just, how come it is that I'm the first person who's noticed what the Canada-China Investment Treaty is all about? You know what it is? My friends in the other parties, when they show up in the House of Commons, that it's most of the days that house is empty. Parliament is empty except for question period or for when there's votes. And my friends in the other parties receive, when they're there, it's because they've been assigned something called house duty. They call it house duty, I call it showing up for work. You're supposed to be there in the moment, working on what's in front of you. You can't be an effective parliamentarian if all you're doing is trying to create winning conditions for a situation that's unforeseeable that will exist three years from now in the next general election. You can't be an effective parliamentarian or represent your constituents if your whole life is dictated by trying to get, you know, who's going to remember in 2015 that when I was trying to draw attention to Bill C-38 beyond the budget bill, the key issue for Tom Mulcair was why was Conrad Black allowed back into Canada? You know, for 10 whole days, right? I could think, please, please, because they get a question every day and I get one a week. We, no one will remember those things, but they will remember what happens in Parliament and the fact that we're there, me, plus Donald Galloway, plus Chris Turner, and then I swear there will be more, so that we can go forward and prove to the rest of Canada you can be a political party that serves your constituents first, Canada first, and your party last. You can be a political party that cares more about democracy and the future of this planet than your own poll points from one week to the next. You can be in Parliament and care more about your grandchildren having a future and stopping greenhouse gases from reaching the tipping point where we run into global runaway, runaway global warming, which is to me the biggest thing that I panic about, even more than the Canada-China Treaty. We can be a political party that stands for what's true and what's real and not what is the illusory hallucinations of the spin doctors in the back room. before November 26th, when the voters in Calgary Centre and Victoria go to the polls, please sign up to do phone canvassing. We need you. Come over to Victoria. We need you. Go to Calgary Centre if you've got friends there. We are, in, we are this close to tripling the Green Party caucus. And as I said, it would be so extraordinary and it would deliver a message that I think could drive Stephen Harper out of office before 2015, which should be... Didn't uh, take off quite just yet and just give us another five minutes.